Radio. You're listening to Crypto Current, the only podcast that explores the bold projects, exciting opportunities, and the growing reach of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Whether you've got skin in the game or you're just crypto curious, keep an open mind, enjoy the conversation, and stay crypto current. Now here's your host, Richard Carthon. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent. Your host here, Richard Carthon. And today, got a very special guest. We got Chris Snook. And oh my gosh, I want to say this is going to be a highly, highly, highly fun episode. Tune in. Hope you're geared in. Have a seatbelt on because there's just so much knowledge that's about to get dropped on you. You just don't even understand. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm fired up. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, First of all, you're highly involved in the in the crypto space, and like you're you're a part of just so many different things in both crypto, blockchain, economics. Your your, your resume is just so long. Can you just tell us a little bit of background before we dive into this? Yeah, the uh, you know the shortest version. I, I've been I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I I went to school and uh, decided to go to grad school because I couldn't find you know income from a job after four years of college that. Felt good. I, I played college football division two. And at that time in my life, I knew it wasn't going to last forever. I had no delusions of that, but, but I went all in. I have one of those personalities. that's either basically a light switch. I'm either on or I'm off. And if I'm on, right. it's right. If I'm off, I'm not interested. And <laughs> I really didn't, you know, I, I think the worst question you ask an 18 year old is what do you want to be when you grow up? Cause I, I just don't think, you know, maybe, maybe your generation um, does because I think you've, you, you've kind of come up in a different era but I still don't think so. I think it's just a terrible question. I think, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's just a lot of pressure, right? And so I yeah. picked certain things because I was like, well, I, I want to play base, I want to play football because that's what I can do right now. And I want to play music mm-hmm. because I was into the music. And, you know, it was like, how do you go to school to do that? And so I really used college as an excuse to keep playing football. Um, and it wasn't because I was dumb or, you know, a jock. It, it was just, I just didn't know what I was going to study. So I I say this all just for quick context. I had no interest in business. I mean, that I knew of, I didn't know I was into business and I certainly didn't know it would become such a life passion of mine. A few short layers later, it wasn't on my radar at all. I majored in exercise physiology because I've always been pragmatic. And this is going to tie into your question in a second, because I'm much more of a pragmatist than I'm a futurist, Mm -hmm. but I've always been curious about the near term and long term future. And I've always been very curious about the past because I think it helps us understand that. And it's only been through pragmatics though. So why did I major in exercise physiology? You were a football player and baseball player at Tulane. You probably know because (laughs) I'm going to spend 16 to 20 hours a week in class. I want to study stuff that's going to make me stronger. So I could what? Be a better football player. (laughs) And so, um, you know, fast forward, fast forward from 1994, when I entered college, 98, I graduated, you know, now we're in 2020, right? So fast forward, you know, 26 years from that 18 year old. And, um, and, you know, here I am. And in the last 20 years, I've been an entrepreneur, but I didn't, you know, entrepreneurship wasn't a thing. You didn't like sign up to be an entrepreneur on Instagram in 1999, right? Like right. it wasn't something you put in your hashtag and, and there was no such thing, right? It was literally, you couldn't get a job. And, um, and so uh, I, I didn't set out to do that. I set out to become economically independent. That's right. what I wanted. I wanted to do what I wanted for the rest of my life with who I wanted to do it with, where I wanted to do it, when I wanted to do it, however big or small I wanted to do it. That's how pragmatically simple my dream was Mm -hmm. and how laser focused it is still today. Um, And so, you know, all this stuff and everything that you're going to hear from me today, any of it that impresses you, any of it that you think is insightful is literally just a means to my end. It literally has just been scooped up along the way of me banging my head against the wall, failing, succeeding, failing again, succeeding, failing, screwing up, um, getting sued, whatever the hell the thing was, right? right? It's all just been scooped up. So it comes out, it's like, it could be very overwhelming sometimes to be like, oh my gosh, what you got to understand is in 1998, 99, none of this was even on my radar or something I want to do. I didn't even get started. I didn't read a book for pleasure until I was 25 years old. Wow. <laughs> and now my life has been consumed by some of the books that we'll probably talk about throughout this. So 
Right. Again, wherever someone's listening to from, if you get something out of this, this show's all about you today. I'm just here to try and hopefully give you some ammo that you can run your life with. But I've been, uh, you know, on the front lines of building stuff for 20 years. And um, the last 12, 10, uh, 10, 10 to 12, I can't, it depends. Oh, nine. So what's that? 11 years. So the last 11 years has been primarily and heavily in uh, tech related stuff. Right. Um, but, so, you know. No, so start. on that, and, and, and thanks for, for breaking all that down, because again, everyone listening, it's definitely going to become very clear why you started there. Um, before we kind of weave in, in, into the, the amazing presentation that you just gave that we're going to unpack, you know, what was your first introduction into the crypto and blockchain space? Like, where did you first hear about it? When did it pique your interest? You're like, I want to dig into this. Yeah, uh, two, two points to that question. And um, I, <laughs> I'm not going to answer it like most people, but it's going to sound like it, which is always a pain. I hate that I have to say this. The first time that I remember hearing about or, or taking a look at something related to crypto was it had to have been 20, uh, it must have been like mid to early 2011-ish. Wow. And I say that because I remember the office I was in and I wasn't in that office in 2012. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were, I was in San Diego at the time and I was in this co-working space called The Hive. And somehow, and I don't remember how, somehow I got this email um, and I was doing a lot of stuff. We owned a publishing company at that time. So I was working with a lot of thought leaders in business, like leadership, you know, authors, things like that. So somehow through that, I got this email and I can't, I, for the life of me, I probably have like three Bitcoins sitting over there and it's cost, it's it's like one of those stories of law. Right? <laughs> Just sitting um, there. There's, there was some company that came out, it was called Bit Something. And I can't remember, but it was kind of like Quora um, meets, you know, Reddit, right? It was, okay. the concept was in 2011, you can um, create an account and we're going to give you what they called bits. Essentially, they were sats. They were satoshis, right? But they called right. them bits. So a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. We're going to give you 30,000 satoshis. <laughs> I didn't know what a satoshi was right. at the time. We'll give you 30,000 satoshis to open up your account. And what the point of it was, was you basically logged in and you created a profile. And then people could ask, how do I start up? How do I raise my money for my idea? Or... Um, how do I fire a, a toxic employee? Like it was a business kind of form, right? And right. so the idea was you you answer questions for free and you would ask me a question and I'd answer it. And then you would tip me in Satoshi. <laughs> so you just basically would send me, and I remember thinking at that time, this is brilliant because nobody in the real world, I had heard about Bitcoin, I'd read about it. Like I didn't really understand it. Uh -huh. I knew what it was from a currency. I understood it in monetary theory sense, but I didn't understand the technology at the time. I did because it was, you know, like I said, 2011 ish, somewhere in there. Right. And, um, but I had done so much after the crisis, kind of really unpacking like things like the fourth turning. I, I, I've talked about that book a lot. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit today. You know, I, I'd already done it. So I, I understood it conceptually. I just didn't really understand the technology, why it made it different. But what I did know was user adoption was going to be slow just because mm -hmm. my, kind of pattern recognition in business. I was like, this is going to be forever, right? This is not going to happen overnight. And if it lasts at all. And then when I saw that, I went, wow, that's genius. That could actually work because now someone's basically, they don't know what this crap is, but they're doing this for free anyway. So right. now they're getting something. It's kind of like games, right? It's like you get all these free tokens. Like maybe this will be worth something someday. So I started to answer questions and people started tipping me like 27,000 sats and 30,000 sats and 40,000 sats. So I don't even want to know how much is over there. I, I, dude, I have no idea. I don't, I never, I don't even know what the private key was. I don't know what the password to get it. I couldn't even tell you the name of the thing. It's probably gone, but it was the first exposure I had. I didn't think about it again till um, I moved to Colorado. So that would have been June of 2013. And I believe in like July of 2013, I can't remember if that's accurate or not. But I think in July of 2013 is when Why Bitcoin, the, the letter Y, Bitcoin, it was a magazine. It, it came out. And somehow I got on their list, um, probably through that thing. As I don't know. And so I subscribed to it because I was like, okay, cool. There's a magazine. First time there was a magazine that I, I think they were the first magazine. Okay. Um, and uh, I can't remember if that's the one Vitalik wrote for or not. Because again, I didn't know who any of these guys were back then. I didn't care. But like Genesis, like Gemini, some of these things were like starting to write about in that. So July of 2013, I became a subscriber of that. And they and I still have like the first, I think they only sent like four issues. It was like quarterly or something. Um, so I, I, I really became curious about it. But it was totally like not, it, there was nothing to get, there was nothing to dive into. I was just curious. Right. right. I'm just consuming it curiously because I don't have any hobbies. Um, 
And, uh, and then in like 14 and 15, um, I created and produced two large startup weeks in Fort Collins because I wasn't doing anything. I was retired. I was kind of um, on sabbatical. Uh, one of the startups we had founded, which wasn't in the crypto space at all in San Diego, was um, was going well, but not not near exit yet. And there was no day-to-day role. So the publishing company, we had to shut down because it didn't work. And the founder that we invested in kind of had difference of opinion. And anyway, you know, partnerships, fill. So I spent right. most of 2012 winding that down. And we moved to 2013, we moved to Colorado and just wanted something fresh, check it out. And I was really looking for like, what am I going to do next? Like, what's that thing? But I'm going to be patient this time. And um, and so in 2014, we did an event. I had a guy that was like one of the first Bitcoin ATM guys come out and do a presentation. So I kind of was like curious about it. I was watching it and I was kind of, but I wasn't invested in it. I had none of the ones that I had, I had lost. Um, I don't even know what it was worth. Obviously, Mount Gox happened in 2015, soon, soon after that. And I, went, I remember thinking like, well, good thing. I probably would have lost it all anyway. Yeah. Um, and then in 2017, we got serious. Yeah. Not, okay. not because of price. Not because of price, though. So we can take another question. But I, I want to say 2017 is when we got serious. And if we get to it, I'll tell you why. But it was when uh, Travis, who who wrote a book with me. So Travis, who is the co-host of Bad Crypto with Joel Kahn, mm-hmm. who just brought on this event that you listened to where I did this keynote. Um, he and I wrote a book called Digital Sense, which was nothing about crypto, but it was all about operationalizing customer experience in, in your company. Right. And that came out with Wiley in 2017, um, first part, like January. And then in July, he had started the podcast. And yeah. all of a sudden, they had gotten like 2,500, you know, whatever in the first like month. And and, and I was, he was like, you know, we're doing this thing. You want to be involved? I'm like, well, you don't really need me. I don't know how I could be involved. Like, you guys are killing it. Like, just have fun and do it. And you know, I'll find another way. And so when I saw that start to happen, I went, the tipping point is here. You know, I remembered 99, but I was too dumb and too immature to understand what I was looking at. In 04, when that second wave of internet 2.0 kind of hit through 07, I was too broke from the failure of the first one. So I couldn't Mm -hmm. act. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw the thing happening in 2017 and I went back through, I was like, it's gone. This is, this is going to be the first wave. This is going to be the run up and then it's going to trough it's happening now. I need to find a way in. And that's right. kind of when I got serious. And that was a journey. Awesome. And like, huh, the, the journey in is always so people first hear about it and you're like, uh, let me just see how I can get involved. And then like, once you get to the tipping point of like, all right, I'm serious and I'm in when people flip that switch, it's amazing to see like how deep they go in and just like how much starts happening quickly, but in a, in a great and positive way. And so, I mean, just fast forward to now, I mean, you just finished virtual blockchain week um, that the bad crypto just put on, gave an amazing presentation. I'll put it in the show notes of where you can go listen to that. And, and, and just for everyone listening right now, we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of what was talked about, but then at the end, he kind of got cut a little bit short. So we're going to spend time uh, expanding on that. But, but first, you know, your presentation was basically on, Um, post-pandemic, like what is the life after COVID potentially going to look like? Um, Can you just give like a a brief just overview of like what that is? And I'm going to unpack some certain questions from some other things that you gave me a presentation. Yeah. yeah. So I think the the context without stealing the thunder of those who watch the the full replay, the context that, that I always like to set first is that human beings, you've heard this before, human beings are creatures of habit. Right. And Right. Um, habits habits are nothing more than the sum total of our thoughts, feelings, and actions, right? And um, for those of you who may have studied, you know, stuff like Think and Grow Rich or uh, maybe Wallace Waddle's Science of Getting Rich, or if you go way back down that personal development or that that kind of philosophical rabbit hole, you'll run into As a Man Thinkers by, you know, by um, James Allen or um, uh, my one of my other favorite ones is um, Master Key System by Charles Hanna, which was written in 1911. And what's funny about that, and I, I digress a minute, because all those books came out between 1907 and like 1930-something, 100 years ago. If you think about what was going on at that time, it's very similar. Yeah. Right? There was, the panic, right? There, there was the panic of 1907, for those who aren't banking nerds, right? And it was one of the worst panics. And there was no central bank at that time because Andrew Jackson, our president, had killed the second central bank and he got shot for it. But he had basically destroyed the central central bank of the country after the Civil War. And so we had no central bank. We had independent banks. And um, J.P. Morgan steps in and backstops them and basically acted like the Fed. Mm -hmm. And 
for those who know monetary history of Red Creature from Jekyll Island, you know that in 1913, the six richest families representation at that time, who, who had about 60% of the world's wealth, go down to Jekyll Island, Georgia, under, under cover of darkness, and they create and have a meeting um, that essentially turns into the 13th Amendment, which is the Federal Reserve Act. And so um, the IRS gets formed soon thereafter and everything else is so that we can be collateralized as citizens. So all this happens right around 100 years ago. And so all these books come out about 100 years ago. The Master Key System, 1911. I think James Allen's book came out, As a Man Thinketh, in like 1907. I can't remember exactly when that was. Um, the Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill, which was four volumes that Carnegie had commissioned him to write. Didn't pay him to, but said, if you spend 20 years with me, I'll introduce you all my friends, interview and find out what we have in common that the rest of the people don't, right? That's Thinking Grow Rich. It started mm -hmm. out as The Laws of Success. And then in 1937, it got published as a uh, synopsis in Thinking Grow Rich. If you think about that time, right, the mass society, you had the haves and the have-nots. There was no income tax before that. So you had these... You know, you've all heard about these mega billionaires, you know, that would have that existed back then. Carnegie, Rothschild, um, you know, uh, Rockefeller. Yep. Well, we're, these books of major philosophy around how you think and this feeling and action that happened then. So the so this kind of first wave of consciousness, but there was no Internet. There was just a printing press. And so the distribution was limited. Right. And and so we're kind of at that moment again. These books are more relevant than ever, but they're still relevant. And, and there's this kind of awakening opportunity again, because every hundred years, if, you've, if you haven't heard of the book, The Fourth Turning, it's one of the ones I recommend um, by Neil Howell and William Strauss. They talk about these generational macro cycles, how every generation is born or dies during a, a period of these four seasons. So think winter, spring, summer, and fall. The crisis is winter. Summer is called the high, or I'm sorry, uh, summer is called the spring. Um, oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. It's Sunday. <laughs> summer is not the high. So you get the high after the crisis. So the high is like springtime, yeah. right? Then you got summer, which is the unraveling, and then you have, or the awakening, and then you have the unraveling, which is fall, and then you have the crisis again. So every 25 years, you move through one of these four things. Well, we've been in the crisis since about 2005. But the reason why they know that is because it's happened every 100 years, 80 to 100 years. It's happened for the last how many years they went back. I think they went back to 1500 wow. in this analysis. So when someone's born, like I was born as a Gen X, I was born during a period of time where essentially the unraveling was occurring. And so uh, what happens during that time is everyone's trying to maintain the high and the awakening that their parents lived through or that they lived through as children, but they're working twice as hard. And so for, for those in the Gen X, like as an example, we're the, we're the latchkey generation because our parents were basically the first ones that were both going to college. That never happened in America before, right? But right. because they were both going to college, then they were both going to work. And what did that mean for the kids? Mm -hmm. Daycare. Yeah. Right? It meant things that didn't exist for the generation prior. And so what happens when these things occur and both parents are out doing their thing, um, the child grows up nomadic because the child becomes independent, not because they wanted to be, but as a generational archetype, they become nomads. And so this is kind of an, one of the archetypes that happens. And I had no choice over that. You know, unless you believe in, you know, cosmetology and numbers. And then I came down at a certain time as a number to reincarnate. But I didn't have any choice that I'm aware of. And when I was born, mm -hmm. right, I just was born then. You didn't either. Depending on when we're born, we're, we're one of these archetypes. And then when we come of age, meaning when we're finally aware of it, something's happening in the world. Right. So like our kid, who's eight and a half, is growing up now during COVID. Now, he knows what's going on because he's conscious. He knows he's home. He knows he's homeschooling. Right. right? So this thing. But it's for him, for some of his generation, unfortunately, they're in tough situations. They're living in apartments, maybe with abusive parents. Like there's there's a lot of things that are happening now that are not good. And we know that beyond the disease. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you think about at scale, every eight and a half to 12 year old kid or every eight and a half called the 16 year old kid that can't be emancipated is aware of COVID-19. And they're aware that stuff's shut down and they're aware that parents are working from home or not working at all or unemployed, much like a child that same age in 1929 through 1940 was aware that there was a Great Depression. Yep. How did that shape a generation? <laughs> Greatly. <laughs> now, go, 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 go forward. Go between me and you. Yep. Right? So I'm Gen X. I grew up at a time where essentially... Markets are roaring, the 80s, right? I'm coming of age when I'm that age. 
the stock market is roaring. Black Monday happens. I'm 12 years old. My parents told me a story that when we were at Disneyland, my dad was a teacher. We won a free trip to Disneyland. We were Disney World in Florida. We wouldn't have gone there the second time because it took them years to save up to go the first time a couple years earlier. My grandmother put in a raffle and won a trip to Disney World. So when I was 12, we got to go back for free. And it was all expenses, right? It was one of those like things that used to happen back then. And so we go down there. And I don't remember this. But apparently, I've always been interested in business because we get in the airport. And my parents, who were like 40-something at the time, are bringing my 12, me and my sister, who's like eight, um, through the airport. And it's Black Monday, <laughs> right? It was and so real. the largest stop crash at that time in history since the Great Depression is happening. And they said, I'm glued to the television in the airport at 12. Like, I'm watching it. And they're going, and I'm asking them, like, what's going on? And, and I'm, like, glued to it. And they're like, we don't know because we don't own any stock, right? Because he was a teacher. They didn't own anything in that way. And so they said it was so funny because they're like, when you started getting into business, it really wasn't that shock because even though you didn't grow up around it, for whatever reason, like, even on even on vacation when Black Monday happened, you were glued to the TV Yeah. And uh, while you're at Disney World. <laughs> and so, so the point is, is that these generational things happen, and then they shape how we act. Most people under the age of 35, but that are working today, have zero clue how it is to operate in a tough environment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to talk down to Gen Y and Gen Z. I'm trying to, in fairness, enlighten you that it's not your fault. It's when you were born. Yeah. Right? Think about when 2008 happened. How long ago was that? 12 years. So a 12 year old in 08. Is 24 today. Yep. What's the average age of influencers on Instagram? Somewhere between 24 to 30 years old. 30, yeah. So no freaking clue how to build a real business. Right. And I'm, and not saying that, I'm not saying that as a demeaning thing. I'm saying that as you've built something, but you built it in an era of unprecedented technology. You built it in an era of attention. You built it in an era of free money mm -hmm. because interest rates have basically been at zero for the last 10 years. Right. right. And there's there's two things I want you to unpack. So like real quick, you, you made an analogy of of the, the concept of imagine you had a candle and like you had to go out and like mill your field to get whatever. Then you woke up and you had all this technology. Can you can you do that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Berkeley and Hart, again, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you guys are writing these names down because I, I can brag about all this stuff because none of it really is my ideas. I'm just a good dot connector of other people's ideas. So Gerd Lee and Hart. Uh, e, uh, or you can look him up. G Leonhard at at um, is on Twitter. I think is his thing. But he wrote a book called Technology versus Humanity. But he's a futurist. We had him out in Fort Collins. I I'd been following him for a couple of years. We hired him to speak at an event we did in Fort Collins in 2014. We became friends with him um, for the first time in person. We've been on virtual forever. But he wrote he had a saying a couple of years ago, and I can't remember exactly when he first did it. But it was probably right after that event. So it was far before COVID, right? Yeah. And he's, he's a futurist, and, and he really is someone who observes the future. He likes to say, I observe the future versus predict it, because he's not like a toffler who predicts 50 years out. He looks out three to five years, eight years, and goes, these are the things that exist today. These are the macro forces and changes. This is what I think the outcomes are going to be, right? Yeah. And so he has a phrase that he uh, coined that says, in the next 20 years, and I believe he said it in 2015, so between 2020, 2035. doesn't really matter. You can say today to 2040 still holds true. In the next 20 years, humanity, all of us, because we're all humans, mm -hmm. will experience the equivalent amount of change from today that the prior 300 years demonstrated combined. So the way I try and you know analogize that in layman's terms is I say 1720. Imagine today you go to bed in the year 1720. Now, most of us have read books or studied that at some level. We know what that means, right? We may not know everything that was available, but we know that we basically didn't have electricity. We yeah. know that we didn't have highways. We didn't have airplanes. We didn't have any of this stuff. It's 1720. We lived off the land. We were a colony of 13 um, or almost 13. I can't even remember if it was 13 colonies at that point yet, but soon thereafter it was. We were under British rule. And essentially, it was a wild, you know, east over here, right? Like, it, we're just this colony. We're this little enslavement to your, to British. And um, we, it was colonial. So you'd go to bed tonight and you'd wrap a bearskin rug or like something made out of animal wool over you as a blanket. You'd read by a candle or you'd, you know, drink whatever you could make and ferment in your house. And then you would go to bed. And then 
the rooster would crow in the morning and you'd wake up and that was your alarm clock. So imagine you went to bed tonight and then you woke up tomorrow and you were listening to this podcast and your alarm clock was an iPhone mm -hmm. and your um, you know, you had, I mean, just all the crap you got today. Yeah. I if you had not. that amount of change in a 24 hour period or even a 20 year period, how would it make you feel? And the answer is simple. You'd be overwhelmed. Yeah. There's no other answer, but you'd be overwhelmed. The, the crazy thing about Gerd's quote is that if you and I think about everything we know, you knew how to log on to this. You and I knew how to do this and record this. Most of the people listening to this are listening to this on the go or on a podcast or on a stream or on something, right? And it's subscribed and you have all these, you have credit cards, you have all this stuff. Take everything you know today and make that a bearskin rug and a candle you have to blow out. Right. And then go forward 20 years and you're going to feel like that dude. And it's, and like that, it stuck out to me. I was like, that is so like true. Just thinking about even, you know, I'm, I'm 26 and the amount of change that's just happened in my lifetime. I feel like it's just so much. And it, it's a realistic thing. Technology is moving at such a fast pace that we have, we just have to keep up and we're going to go through so much change so quickly that the people who are trying to, you know, be present with where we are, but be conscious of where the future is headed. You're just going to have so much more advantage than, than people who are just, being and and why I think this is super relevant. And to come back to COVID really quickly, you dropped some really big facts on some different things that are going on with with COVID. Can you can you touch on a couple of those? Um, which which one specifically? I mean, there's a, so, there's yeah, a, the, the, the biggest one of, where we're headed yeah. to poverty with uh with people uh being uh driven oh, to poverty. Yeah. So, you know, so there's a statistic out there. Statista has uh, some research that a, a predicted half a billion, it's like 547 million or something, somewhere around a half a billion new people will be pushed into poverty because of COVID-19. Um, Which you know, is that, wild. That's almost, so sometimes these numbers are too big, right? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. And then is that going to really impact me? I think the blessing, and this is, this is, I'm saying this with all sensitivity because for a lot of people, this is not a blessing. But, you know, the law, law of uh, the universe is very important to understand with some of these things because we all know gravity, right? So mm -hmm. gravity is in a law that really cares whether you agree with it or not. It treats us all the same. Yep. That's what's called a universal law. So a man-made law is a speeding uh, limit or something like that. You and I can break it, and then unless we get caught, we don't pay the price. A universal law is something where it doesn't matter if we're rich, good looking, ugly, fat, skinny, poor, broke, genius, um, you know, disabled. It doesn't matter who we are. If you violate the law of gravity and you're up high enough, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Or you're rolling an ankle or blowing out a knee or something because the law of gravity treats us universally the same. And the law of gravity is one of several universal laws, but it's the one almost every one of us doesn't, you know, have to think about. And we understand what it is. Well, another law called the law of polarity says that you can't have a left without a right. In other words, you, you and I, there's two sides to everything. Yeah. You can't know up without down. So if you're looking for what's right about this or what's wrong about this interview, you'll be able to find it because you can't have what's right about it without also understanding what Chris forgot to say. Yeah. So and if you... Now, if you take this out into troll culture or internet culture, right? Everyone's like, oh, trolls. You can't have someone be great and not have people trash them. It's like you can't have people think someone walks on water and not have them think they're the devil. Yeah. They, they cannot exist. So you can't have COVID and have it be a curse without it simultaneously being a blessing somewhere. Yeah. And, so I say and, it through that lens. I say it through that lens. The blessing of COVID-19 is that it is universally hitting us all. And there has never been in our lifetimes or any of the generations that are living, my parents, your, your grandparents, right? Maybe your yep. parents, depending on how, how old they were when they had you. There has never been something that has shut the entire world down ever. Yeah. And Mine's I mean, and that, and that is like that. If you just sit with that for a second, you realize, wow. So why is this different? Well, because it is truly unescapable. Like, Jimmy Fallon is doing TV shows from his condo. There is no 
class of people or rank of human beings that is not equally impacted by this. Sure, they might live in a better house than someone else. Sure, they might have more money. Right. But they're constrained and their and their fear is similar. And and so it's a common enemy and it's also a common opportunity. And so I think that you know when we look at stats like half a billion people are going to be forced into poverty that's just one stat. That's a shock stat. That's a clickbait stat, right? Because you're going to really, oh man, I'm looking for bad news. Let me find it. There it is. Um, you're also got 1.4 billion people being forced to school at home between, you know, K through 12. Yep. Not counting universities. 1.4 billion people forced from Zooming or forced from learning remote um, doesn't mean that they want to stay that way. Yeah. But when you think about all the things like homeschool, when you think about disrupting education, when you think about the exorbitant price and lack of value of higher education in most cases, right, I'm not going to pick on any universities. I will name I will name one that that has got a tremendous value because it's easier to name one that's doing something right. But when you think about how many schools are charging 25, 30, 40 K a year and they're not Harvard, um, like – and I'm not saying Harvard. I'm just saying it's not so, right? And everyone knows yeah. it. you're laddering up with student debt. Your whole generation is piled on student debt, right? Um, and, and so, so you know, when you think about these numbers, 1.4 billion people forced at home. All of a sudden, that makes everybody reevaluate the the, uh, the value prop, right? And even it, the concept of money. And I think this is a good transition where, where I was trying to bring this was like, you know, you you brought up a really interesting conversation about a 25 year old in 1980 versus a 25 year old right now. Um, oh, yeah. can, you, can, you, can you touch on that real quick? Yeah, I, no, actually I'd like to go deeper on that because that's one of the slides we flew past on the other thing. So let's spend a little time there and then we'll go to the other thing. That's perfect tie in. It's a great segue because they can get the rest of the stuff if they watch the other video. So right. if you're, if you're, tw- so I'm just forget, forget if you are, you're 26. Okay. Yeah. If you go back a generation, not even my generation, you go to baby boomers, right? right? They were 26 in 1980. Now, why does that matter? When you're 26, what are you thinking about? I'm not going to tell you what you're thinking about. I'm going to ask you. So let's role play this. What are you thinking about right now? Why are you doing this podcast? Why are you wanting to learn from people like me or whomever or your audience? What, what do you care about? What are you worried about? Uh, trying to learn as much as I can, trying to grow business, trying to, you know, establish myself in the world. Uh, I'm trying to build. Everything's about building and learning and growing right now. Okay. What do you fear? Um, not being able to uh, take care of myself, right? Not having my own independence, being a quote unquote failure by the world's view. And, and, um, honestly, like just incurring so much debt to where I I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, do you plan on having a family at any point? And, and if if not, that's okay. But do you know people that do? That are yeah, oh, 100%. So like everything I'm doing right now is to provide for my future family. I'm trying to set a good foundation to set them up for success. Okay. So Richard, you are unique for your unique reasons. But is any of what you just told me unique as far as something that people your age care about? Probably not. It's not. Every generation cares about that. When I was 25 years old and I turned 25, my... It was the one time on a birthday that I've cried and I was almost like overwhelmed to the point of where I, because here's where, here's where I was at 25. I had broken off an engagement, which I'm glad that I did because it was the right decision. I was not going to be happy if I ended up moving forward with marrying that person. Mm -hmm. But because I had started that trajectory at 23, I had all these assumptions in my head that by 25, I'd have a kid out. I'd have, I'd be making 75 K a year. I'd have my master's degree, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right? right, because when you're 18, you get up seven years is forever from now. Jesus, that's a lifetime. <laughs> right? right, because at 18, seven years earlier you were 11, so it feels like forever. So at 25, I woke up. I was halfway through an MBA. I had finished an MSBA, except for defending the thesis in exercise physiology. I was not married, which was okay with me. That was actually fine. But I had no prospects of when I was going to want to be in a relationship again, because at that point, I didn't even want to get in a relationship at that point. So that was a whole mind twist, because then I'm thinking, well, how am I going to have kids? Like, you know, like, oh, I don't have kids, and I want, I want them someday, and I don't even want a relationship right now, so that's going to be way out in the future. And, and, and I was working in a bar, bouncing, mm-hmm. and I woke up, and I'm like, I'm a piece of shit. I'm two master's degree deep. The market tells me I'm not worth more than $37,000 a year. I live in San Diego where 
that's not even broke. That's like right. poverty. It's hard. <laughs> and I, and I did everything I was supposed to. Right. So guess what? My parents, your parents, their parents at 25 felt the same way. That's the point. Yeah. So why does that matter? Well, in 1980, if you have the vantage point you look at right now and you're looking out into the world, whether you understand all these things or not, here's what your reality was. The Dow Jones average was 972. <laughs> 972. Uh, okay. Interest rates were in the teens. So yeah, a mortgage was going to cost you maybe 13, 14, 15% on, right. on your interest for a home. And so for quick perspective, the Dow Jones is at about 24K right now for perspective, everyone. For perspective, yeah, for those who aren't following that. 972 versus 24,000. And the real lesson is this, 972 with nothing but upside because it was low, 24,000, 26,000 hit all-time highs this year in a market that obviously doesn't function <laughs> yeah. from a fundamental standpoint, meaning it's no one believes that any of these businesses are going to have the future that they think they're going to have. They just... It doesn't, it's totally disconnected from reality. So if I'm a 26 year old today, last thing I'm thinking about doing is buying in the stock market. Now here's what's going to screw people's minds. The stock market's going to go higher. Yep. And, and, you know, I may be wrong on that, but I don't think so. And a lot of smarter people than me, a lot of richer people than me are, are, are in the camp of, we're going to see what's called the, you know, the blow off top. We're, we're not even there yet because we have to manufacture this growth in order to keep this Ponzi scheme going. So, It'll go higher, but it's a it's a gambler's trap. It's like the roulette wheel at Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. And unless you're an AI algorithm bot with a bunch of billions behind your name, you have no chance of winning that game. So as a 26-year-old, you don't need to know why. You just gut level probably know the market's not for me. Equities aren't for me. Yeah. Okay? But in 20, uh, a 26-year-old 1980, the markets were you know, brand new, they're roaring. Equities was what cryptos are now. People were starting to go public on the small caps. There was, you know, you've seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street. Like that all happened because people were ready to play the game called penny stocks, like altcoins. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Altcoins were penny stocks of old. Exactly. So that's a great. So, that's great. So the point is, is in 1980, I'm trying to fi figure out how not to be a piece OS. I'm trying to figure out how maybe I could have a family someday. Maybe I could afford something someday. Maybe I could not be in debt for up to my eyeballs someday. That's what every 25, 26 year old thinks. And in right. 1980, they had interest rates where you could put money in a bank and save and earn 10 points. So literally a thousand dollars in a bank was earning you 10% interest. <laughs> we don't have to tell you what it's earning today because it's not earning anything. No, not the it hasn't earned over a quarter of, of a point of interest in a savings account. And all these teaser rates of 1.125, 1.25, 2.5, 5% are on the first $2,000 invested, not the rest. Yep. And they're teaser rates to get you to open an account. And that's been the case since, you know, I don't even know, 2015, 2016. So there's no savings, right? You've heard about the savers get punished. And the reason why you have more billionaires co compounding growth like crazy is because it became about shareholder value somewhere in that middle, right? Yep. And, and so unless you were in the shareholder side, you couldn't benefit. So savers have been punished, but back then you could save. The yield curve, not going to get into what the yield curve is. If some of you know, great. If not, just understand the basics. At that time, the yield curve, there was a lot of spread in it. So what it looked like was over the next 40 years, you could be safe and you could make money. There was growth ahead in the market. And so when you're looking at 26, most people think I'm going to retire by 65. That's not true, but that's what they think. Right. And most people aren't going to work for their whole life because they love it because the majority of people don't see work and play as the same thing. Entrepreneurs, maybe this audience typically do. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so it's not about retiring and never working again and sitting on a beach and being lazy and getting fat, but that's most people's dream because the 87% of people, according to stats I saw years ago, hate what they do. They just do it for the money. Yeah. And to sustain the lifestyle that so I don't think that it's probably too much different today than it was a generation ago because it becomes a thing. You get to an age and now you got to provide. You're out of mommy and daddy's house and you got you want to be a big girl or boy. And so you put on the big pants and you go to work. And so that's what every person your age group was thinking 1980. The difference was the upside was in markets, it was in bonds, it was in that. So you'll hear baby boomers say and you'll hear financial advisors say, no one's ever lost money in bonds for 40 years. Because it's true. Right. But prior to their, prior to that baby boomer generation of 78 million entering that space, that wasn't true. It didn't even exist. Mortgage-backed securities didn't exist until right. the you know, late 70s. 
products. And you're bringing so a lot up, of so these products got invented for the boomers and they drove right. consumption. And if you're 26 right. today, last point, then I'll let you ask the question. Last point is if you're 26 today, the only thing you see Dow's at all time highs and makes no sense. Bond rates are zero or negative. Yep. You can't, so you're basically paying to have risk free money, access to your money, not earning anything on it. Housing prices are through the roof because everyone treated it like an ATM for those years. And then we just kicked the can down the road and interest rates are at all time lows. So yeah, you can afford to, but there's no one to, so you better love it. Right. But it's, it's at such a high price that it's really hard to justify. And if you do lock it in, great. You locked it in for 15 or 30 years at this rate, but you, you better love it because you're not going to flip it for a profit. You're going to live in it, you're which is what it was supposed to be. And so the only place where you can see upside, if I'm 25, 26, is crypto. Right. And, and actually, this transitions into my next question. And, and one of the things you touched on uh, was the four kinds of money. And, and you really touched on like why... In crypto in one of those is is probably one of the best directions to be looking right now. Can you expand on that? Well, I want to caveat this. I, I just said the only place you can look is crypto. Saying it's the best is too generic, yeah. right? Because that'd be like saying the stock market was a good play to 1980s 26-year-olds, and most of them got ripped off in a bunch of penny stock BS. Everything is, the, you have to understand how to start to evaluate. So you got to decide whether you work for money or whether you, you, you know, or you work to live or whether you live to work, right? You have to kind of make some of those fundamental decisions and you're not going to, you, right. you might change your mind over time, but you kind of understand like, what is it that economic independence means to me? Cause it, it, it's not a number, it's your number. Yeah. And your ability to, um, your, your need to understand the mechanics of this other than the curiosity side is going to be based on what that is, what the answer to that question is. So you don't have to become an expert in any of this crap, including crypto, unless you really want to hit big numbers. But if your number is, you know what, man, if I could do what I want from wherever I was or from my place of residence right now, and I could make $8,000 a month, or I could make $4,000 a month, but I had zero debt and I was able to surf and I'm happy, like that is just as noble as someone who wants to go out and try and put a dent in the universe because it's honest. It's true yeah. to who you are. So the real net net of this whole thing, and I'm, I know a lot of other people out there are finally starting to talk about this, is what is your reason? Not what is the reason. What is your reason for any of this stuff? Mm -hmm. And realize that it's going to change. There was a point where I thought $75,000 a year was all the money in the world. And there's been months where I've lost that. Yeah. And there's guys who, who put zeros on that number. And, and I, I like, I just understand that we're all broke at different levels. Right. <laughs> so, so I think that's, that's the caveat, but the, um, the answer is crypto is the future because of two uh, of, of this fundamental thing. There's, there's always been two kinds of money for the most of civilization's history prior to civilization. When we were just roaming around, there was, there was basically just gold, gold and silver, but we didn't even really need that except for when we wanted to exchange stuff. But when we started to settle and civilize, um, gold and silver were, were basically what I call nature's money. Some people call it God's money. They came from the earth. They were rare. They were, you know, they were uh, universally accepted. They've held their value. 3,000, um, you know, loaves of bread or slices of bread cost an ounce of gold. You know, you could buy a formal men's suit with an ounce of gold back in, you know, Jesus's time. You can do that now, right? It's the same, right? A formal men's suit's about 1,500 bucks, 1,700 bucks. If you buy something that's not crappy, and that's what an ounce of gold is. And, you, you know, you do the math on a, on a slice of bread and you multiply that by 3,000, you can pretty much get a slice of bread for 40, 50 cents. So, you know, it's the same, right? It's a store of value. Right. And it was money. And then we created fiat, right? By decree. That's all fiat means is by decree. It's not just about money. You can actually have digital fiat. And that's one thing that I don't think a lot of people think about is that cryptocurrency doesn't mean it's decentralized. It doesn't mean it's Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency means it's it's using public key cryptography. It means it's a more secure method and ledger balance for immutable transactions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it <laughs> means you know, it, like depending on how many nodes are in the network and if they're if they're decentralized or, or if they have shared interests, right? So, so cryptocurrency can be fiat too, and and you'll see central bank digital fiat. They'll call them central bank digital currencies, but the reality is they're just by decree. They're made up out of thin air, just like the dollar is today. Yeah. Um. And 97% of the dollars in the market are ones and zeros on a ledger balance, not paper money. So it's funny when we say the printer goes burr, you know, for every dollar that we print going burr, 
For every three of those, there's 97 digital ones that don't exist anywhere. Mm. Right. So, you know, I think the last time I checked, the, the, the amount of U.S. dollars in circulation was somewhere around 17 trillion actual physical U.S. dollars in circulation. Only 1.6 or 1.7 trillion of those are actual physical C notes and, and 20s and fives. That's wild. So, so my point is, is that um, when you think about the people's money, which is Bitcoin, it's the first time where you created a, a, a way to transact. Um, and, and a potential store of value. And we won't get into the debate on that yet. It, you know, too much time for that. The point is, is that Satoshi created a platform by which and an application by which we, for one, had a, 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 the people's money for the first time. Mm -hmm. You can't subpoena it. You can't shut it down. You can try and kill it. You can ban it. People will go elsewhere, right? Or they'll do it on a table. Like, it, there's no way to kill it at this point unless everyone decides it's not, it's not worth believing it anymore and they're going to go take one of these other three. As their as as their you know main belief system, but how can you do that when there's something that can't be corrupted as easily? That's got you know 11 years plus worth of history, that is barely even getting started, and that has all kinds of people interested, from the smallest toddler buying a couple sats a week, to the you know the Winklevosses, <laughs> right? Like where do you have a community that's that diversified in its population? You mm -hmm. have people that barely have running water in, you know, third world countries that have used Bitcoin. And then you have the Winklevi. Right. In the same network. Believing the, the same field. thing. I think that's right. an interesting dynamic at play. The fourth piece is what we call corporate money, which is obviously the first example that that hasn't been manifest yet, but is in still in process is Libra and the Libra, Libra. network and right. you know, all that. Right. So all of a sudden now, governments are not trying to just control. By the way, 80% of the silver and gold, 80% of the gold in existence out of the ground that's ever been mined is held by the top seven central banks in a vault. So the 20% that's left of official gold is the stuff that is on your wrist or, or available for sale and you know one ounce gold bars or whatever that you and I can go pick up. So the bottom line is, yeah, gold is still a great store of value. You should own it for sure. If you can buy some, I'm... Not giving investment advice personally, but you should look at it because no matter what, it'll preserve your purchasing power. It's got thousands of years of proving that. So whatever the dollar hyperinflates to or deflates to, you don't have to worry if you got gold. You can always preserve your current level of wealth. Yeah. And um, and so the problem though is that the the people who make the rules are the ones who make the fiat currency. And when they blow this system up, which they are and will at some point, they're just gonna come back to the table and ante up with their gold and China's going to have more than it did the last time in Bretton Woods. And so they'll have a seat. They'll have a big seat. Yeah. Right. And so that's the game the central banks are playing. So the, the average, you know, 7.79 billion rest of us that don't get to be in those tables really only have people's money. And we are the product of those making the corporate money. And we don't mind that if it allows us to, convert, you know, and, and transact more efficiently because there's utility in that. So I'm not going to, I'm not on Facebook, but you know, I get it. I'll join Libra with another wallet and, you know, I'll transact with the two and a half billion people there through my businesses or through my personal, because it'll be impossible not to, it'll replace cash if that ever gets done. I yeah. firmly believe that China's already going to do it next November and mm -hmm. WeChat and Ant Financial and Alibaba will pull off the biggest Sputnik moment ever when they basically launch on a Chinese blockchain with Chinese crypto, yep. a largest singles day sale event ever. And it's all done through cryptocurrency that the Chinese government controls. Uh, that may not happen this November, but it's happening soon. DCEP is coming. There's not a whole lot anyone can do to stop it. And you bring up a, a really good point. And, and even through that uh, explanation, one of the other interesting things you like brought on that I, I want to finish with is the concept of like, why is hoarding money a problem? Yeah, I love it. So I know you did a little research on Mr. Gassell. So Sylvia Gassell um, was born in Argentina, but uh, the piece that we didn't get to in the, um, in the other video at length, and we'll go into a little deeper here, is Gassell theory was this concept of free money. And his, he called it free money primarily because he wanted to liberate money from the need to be a store of value. He thought there was a fundamental philosophical 
you know, thing wrong. And again, you can disagree or agree with this. I encourage you to be like me, which is try not to accept, reject, or neglect any idea a year for the first time. Try to understand why you should and what paradigms you have in place that if they're serving you, you you can stick with. But if they're not, maybe you reconsider because that's what real learning is, right? And, right. and I'm I'm doing it as a reminder to myself more than anything else. But um, try this on for a minute. So money has always been a store of value as well as a medium for exchange, right? It served a couple different roles. And, and so currency really is only a medium of exchange. So currencies aren't real. Um, when Jamie Dimon called Bitcoin not real, he wasn't, he was saying it and, and pissed people off in the crypto community because they don't understand currency versus money. The reality is, is neither is the dollar. The dollar is not real, right? <laughs> it's a ledger balance. You can't own a ledger balance. Mm -hmm. Like no matter who you are, you can't, that's why it's like, it's almost, we got to change of an accurate. You can't invest in cryptocurrency. You can speculate in cryptocurrency. Because cryptocurrency is nothing more than a ledger balance. Just like fiat. It's, mm -hmm. it's recording debits and credits into a ledger balance, right? So you can speculate whether those are going to be exchanged at higher or lower rates. And that's what we're doing when we, quote unquote, invest in crypto or when we invest in Forex, in, in currency exchange markets. Yep. Um, but so Sylvia Gassel said currency needs to be in velocity, right? It, that's where it actually moves economies. And so we're seeing this right now. The biggest problem that the Fed or any of these central banks face, and they've faced it before, is that when I lower interest rates, I'm doing that because I'm trying to create stimulus. I'm trying to increase and encourage borrowing because if people borrow, then they do stuff like buy buildings, build buildings, hire people, do R&D, because I'm making it cheap enough to get a higher return on capital by using borrowed dollars versus earned dollars to mm -hmm. build assets. So when they do this, they do this to stimulate. But the problem is when they stimulate, what's typically going on in the economy? Downturns. Downturns. Right. And what is human nature? What is habit? When things get tight, what do we do? Save. Don't spend nothing. We, we, we pucker up, right? <laughs> we yeah. hoard. We save. We, like, we cut expenses. So we buy up all the toilet paper and all of right. <laughs> the store. So, so what happens is, and it's happened forever, and this was happening in the early, late 1800s when Gassel was alive through the early 1900s before he died. But the first experiment happened in the 30s after he was dead. And um, I believe it was in the Netherlands or somewhere in, in uh, that part of the world. And essentially the economy was you know, ruined. Everyone was out of work, 27% unemployment, all that stuff. And so they created this, you know, Sylvia Gassel inspired free money model where literally the town, so not the, not the state, not the country, not that, they, they started issuing money. And basically anybody who owned a business in that town created what was called free money and it was stamped like a coupon. So it expired. So imagine if I paid you $4,000 a month as, you know, a, a living wage, which is, you know, the median income for most states in this country on an individualized basis. Right. Let's so say I paid you four grand a month, but at the end of that month, it was worth zero. Are you going to save it? <laughs> Probably. No. I mean, what am I going to no, do if it's worth nothing? If so I write you $4,000 a month. I write you $4,000. You just got paid. But mm -hmm. that money is going to be unspendable on June 1. What are you going to do with it? Try to sell it. Try to get some sort of value out of it. Well, you're going to buy stuff. You're going to put it in circulation. Yeah. Right? Because it's worthless in 30 days. Oh, now, okay. Why? I, I, mis I misunderstood the question. So if you're giving me money, you're saying in 30 days, this is not going to be worth anything. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm blowing it. Got to. Like if it's yeah, not gonna be gonna spend it. It. Because yeah. if you don't spend it, you get nothing. If you do yeah. spend it, you get $4,000 worth of whatever you spend it on. Right. Now, you could choose to spend that on groceries, on rent, on a car, on going out to the movies, on uh, buying gold. Mm -hmm. So you could choose to save some of it, but you're not going to be able to save it in the dollar that you were given that free money dollar, whatever that is, right? That prompt or that banknote or that, you know, US, whatever the thing was. So what happened was in this 90 day case study, they, they saw 20% growth. They saw employment go below 3% because now all of a sudden you had money to spend. So what did you do? You hired people. What did that do? That increased productivity. What did that do? That gave you more people that were on expiring money to go spend that ate out at restaurants or that bought food or that needed a house over their head. Right. And so, so the, the theory was super controversial in the 30s. And um, John Maynard Keynes actually called him the forgotten prophet because 
what happened was when we hit the depression, um, so story tells that one of the things that was presented before the new deal came out, one of the things that was presented to Roosevelt was this form of, Hey, one thing we could do is this Gassel theory thing. We could basically make, cause we've already forced everybody to pay us in us dollars. You can't pay for American goods without giving us us dollars. So they already kind of started that. So we're like, you can't, um, pay back our debts in anything but U.S. dollars. So we kind of already have this mechanism. What if we made that money expire so people didn't hoard it? So they floated it. He ended up confiscating gold and then pegging gold at the new price and everything. That was the movie made. But he considered Gassel theory. Who, who knows yeah. what history would have been otherwise? What right or wrong? Can't tell. Can't go back. Here's my point. What's wrong with Gassel theory in the sense of the velocity? Nothing. That's what currency is supposed to do. Most people live that rent to rent or month to month anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at first you go, oh, I wouldn't want that. Like, like my paycheck's going to get expired at the end of the month. Yeah, but you don't have any left anyway. You're max maxing out 15, 20% more on credit card. So what are you complaining about? Yeah. You're not saving anyway. And right. even if it did, savings is at zero. So you're not investing and you're not saving anyway. That's the majority of people. You're just flowing money. And the reason why you're hoarding is because you're afraid the flow is going to stop. What if you were guaranteed the flow wasn't going to stop because it expired at the end of the month? That of kind of gets interesting yeah. if you think about it. Now, what's problematic about Gassel theory was at the time, the only thing that existed was printing press. You didn't have a way other than manual ledgers. But now we live in a world where literally, think about this for a minute. You could have a three-dimensional, you could have three-dimensional programmable money. Central banks, or if the central banks fail to do it or fail to regulate against it, and state banks start launching again, under some charter or some other parallel system, and they start issuing gazelle style money, currency, mm -hmm. not money. They call it currency, and they go, hey, guess what? If you employ people and you want to pay them in this, they can spend it everywhere that they already shop in their town, and the, here's the deal. At the end of 30 days, it's evaporated, and we don't have to worry about it. There's no way to not track it because it's all crypto. It's all digital. So mm -hmm. I drop it into, I airdrop it into your wallet on the month of, of the first of the month and it auto debits to where it auto debits to and it goes into their wallets and what's left over you can spend on whatever you want except if you are in Colorado and you leave Colorado and you want to buy weed in Arizona it's not legal in Arizona so it won't go through or mm -hmm. if you're in a you know like you could program rules of space into the currency which right. says if I walk across a geo and my phone tracks that I'm across a certain geographic thing. Certain rules apply and others don't. And I don't have to wonder anymore through smart contracts and through rules of space, that money or that currency will only do certain things in certain places. So now you have you know, Islamic uh, countries and you have Christian countries and you have different things where certain things aren't allowed or certain allowed to be consumed on certain days. And it doesn't matter. I can come in and I can spend my money and I can control what happens without any oversight. So I create all this efficiency in the government because I don't need all these people tracking down or punishing people anymore because the currency right. and i also know exactly where every single cent or whatever it's called that's been distributed is at any given time i don't wonder whether it's under richard or chris's mattress because he's thinking the pandemic's going to last longer than everybody else i don't have to wonder where the cash is because there is no wondering it's all on a ledger balance it all expires at a certain date and if he spent it on gold or some other asset i at least know where he spent it because i track that right yeah. And now, that could be so there's powerful. a whole other dynamic, right? Because then it's like, well, okay, but then I'll, they'll know I bought everything. Well, no, because then privacy coins and other things will emerge. Yeah. And it can be multifaceted and layered and, and just used in so many different ways. And it'll be interesting to see if anyone picks up on this and tries to apply it. But it, I mean, just listening from a practical I think they are. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, the only, I, I'm, I'm, don't know who else is talking about consult theory right now, but but there's versions of this out there. I mean, when you think about the good side of that, like think of all these talks about universal basic income, right? They're not wrong, but the problem is, is that we're politicizing them. Mm -hmm. I think what the, what the COVID-19 crisis has shown is that universal basic income is actually could be a very interesting topic because we're already at 30 million plus unemployed in this country right now, mm -hmm. and it ain't going to get better anytime soon. I mean, no. I'm not saying that doomsday or alarmist. I'm saying do the math. Everybody right now still thinks a, a good percentage of most people think we're going to be in a V-shaped recovery, right? No. Which means as soon as we reopen, everything's going to go back to where it was. 
that's not statistically and probability wise, McKinsey and uh, everybody's doing research on this. At best, it looks like a really long U. Right. It might be an L. The, yeah, hockey stick. And if it's, and if it's the, the U or an L, that means 30 million people aren't going back to work tomorrow anytime soon. But here's one thing they are doing. They all have their smartphone and they're not giving it up. And just by the nature of that smartphone, even if they have to turn off home internet, and even if they have to turn off and get rid of their laptops and they sell everything else they own, they will be subsidized if nothing else, and they will not get rid of their smartphone. People without running water in Africa have a smartphone. So you have this whole world of 7.8 billion people and there's over 10 billion devices and it's gonna go to 14 billion very quickly, even inside of all this. And they're all kicking off data exhaust to the tune of 10 gigabits every 10 minutes right now as, as the current rate of data waste, literally exhaust. What if I could give people not a universal basic income on need, meaning I give it to them because they're poor or I give it, I don't give it to them because they earn over 150 grand or I don't give them any because they're a millionaire. What if I just said, you're a human, you're kicking off data exhaust. That data is like oil. If we can refine that, it's valuable for healthcare, for these different things, especially if it's de-identified. De and so every single one of us, regardless of our wealth, deserves maybe a universal basic income off of data. But how are you going to deploy it? The way they're deploying stimulus checks or PPP money? Hell no. If that doesn't work. That's not transparent. But you could do it with something of a gazelle crypto model. And I think even though a lot of people that are libertarian, including myself, would, would get hung up on the, you know, the trackability and all that, the bottom line is, is that for the mass market of society, it would create an economy again in a way that would be really interesting. And what people did with their money is still up to them. And it would create all this new innovation for the people that did care about privacy or wanted to store wealth in different asset classes. But it would also create flow so that there could actually be growth again while we build this new stuff. And it's tied not to need, it's tied to an asset, which is data that we're all kicking off and manufacturing at unprecedented amounts of, of calculated load every single breath of every day. Yeah. No, and you so bring up... I think, the, I think should be thrown out. The problem is that they're being politicized because, it's again, it's the war against the have and have nots. And right. the Democrats and Republicans are going to each save us. Right. So and we it, got years to go. We got years to go are, before we get... These are absolutely, you know, gems of of ideas and, and things that need to be thought through. And and I, I'm, I'm confident someone is going to hear this and going to just run with it and try to figure out like how this can be applied just because it's you need to be able to think bigger and have like new perspectives on how things can and should work to then be able to find new creative solutions to this unique problem that we're all dealing with right now um but above all chris man i appreciate you spending this time with us you dropped a ton of knowledge a ton of stuff for people to think about um a ton of interest but before you leave you know what is the final thought you want to leave with everybody here today um, you know, I don't know enough about your audience, but I do know, uh, you know, every single one of us is is running through, you know, different waves of this stuff, right? Like some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us um, are worried or wanting to prevent that. Some of us are unemployed. Some of us are pregnant. Some of us are running a business or maybe multiple and wondering if we're going to get, you know, there's so many things going on in people's lives right now. Um, the message without it being like just based in ideological positivity or, or that history tells us history tells us that human beings are unique in the sense that we have found so far in our 10,000 years of recorded history through every collapse that we've had, including the dark ages, we have found a way forward that benefited more pe more percentage of humanity than the prior cycle. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of problems out there. We have a lot of things that aren't right. And if I'm 25, if I'm 45, if I'm any age, because age really is just a matter of your mental health and how you feel and your energy levels. But if I'm 25, I'm starting to get real serious about being patient and being overly obsessive about this kind of consumption. I'm less interested, if I could give you any advice looking back 20 years, I'm less interested in consuming to impress other people. And I'm more interested in consuming knowledge at the level of depth where I can be the, I can fit in any boardroom or any 
situation room 10, 15, 20 years from now, and I could add value to that conversation even if I only say one thing. That was my goal when I started out. I didn't really have a goal other than that. I just wanted to be able to add value in a conversation with people that were way richer, way smarter, and way more powerful than me. And I and that kind of disciplined me to this, you know, daily digestion of whatever I felt like I needed to learn or was curious or, or even maybe that stumped me a little bit that I had to force myself to get into a little bit. Um, and so my advice would be whether you're 25 and you got a little bit of runway, you know, learn, do this. Don't worry about what you're going to do. Learn about who you're going to be and, um, and start being it now, right? And if right. I'm 45, um, realize I'm in a position where, you know, I, I'm going to make the decisions that are going to impact two sides of this coin. I'm going to have the energy and the youth that I'm going to rely on from my Gen Y and Gen Z counterparts. I'm going to have my children that I'm doing it for. And I'm going to have my parents that I got to figure out how I'm going to navigate that generation um, through a time they have never understood because they were the spoiled children of the war generation. And they did a lot of great things. The boomers did a lot of great things, including drive all this prosperity through their consumption. But they are no longer going to be consuming. They are no longer going to be buying the dip of the equities markets. And they're too old to wait and ride out the rise of crypto because they need the money now. Their pensions are vulnerable for the first time ever, which means the promises that they worked their whole life for are likely to evaporate for some or most somewhere in the next 10 years to make all this transition happen for the rest of us. And so have empathy for them instead of hate, right? Again, if we can get back to a world where instead of looking at what the other person did wrong, instead of throwing the other thing under the bus, which I know we're far away from because our leaders are not demonstrating that, but just understand that cyclically, that has to happen too, because we have to get so fed up that a new generation of leaders emerges that are going to not be polarizing and that are going to you know, be there to help build back after the collapse. And the collapse is just a reversion to more simpler times. It's not a collapse of like, you know, something to worry about. It just means that the complexity gets so much that no one understands what to fix. And so the only way, the only way forward is to just start over. And that's what you're living in, guys. This is the most exciting 10 to 15 year window in the history of humankind. It's never happened with 8 billion people before. It's never happened with the majority of limited cities. It's never happened with worlds connected to each other in nanoseconds and picoseconds with high bandwidth connectivity and the ability to create commerce. It's never happened where you could unlock the potential of 3 billion people who live in poverty around the world prior to COVID, who don't have a bank account and who've never been able to participate, but now have a smartphone, but don't know exactly how powerful it is and how much it makes them. The opportunities are endless. And all you have to do is figure out what you're going to contribute to that pie. You don't have to tackle the whole thing. So that's my message. Awesome. And I think that is a gem of a, a final thought. And uh, everyone listening, yeah. trust me, you're not going to sure. want to listen through all of this a couple of times just to unpack um, all the powerful messages that are messages within it. That- but Chris, what are some ways that people can stay connected with you and learn more about some of the various projects you have going on? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the chrisjsnook.com site is is um, you know the best place to uh, you know book me for speaking things or or just kind of follow where I'm at. Um, LinkedIn is is a good place to follow me. Um, it's pretty much where I'm most active. Twitter, I'm active too. My following is not huge on Twitter, but my LinkedIn presence and Twitter um, is is pretty much where I spend most of my time. And then you know, as far as projects that we're working on, um, you know, the uh, the Sandcastle Challenge and Wyo Hackathon. Um, uh, that's coming up. So if you're a developer, if you're, um, if you're interested in, in anything related to kind of the future of, of blockchain related enterprise apps, AI, machine learning, crypto, um, you know, come get on the wait list at yohackathon.io for September. We're going to be doing a virtual hybrid event. That's going to be insane. Um, I co-produce it with Rich Kopcho and Caitlin Long and several others. Um, and uh, we're really excited about kind of the format this year and its third year. And, um, you know, we'll be giving away probably close to a quarter million dollars in, in bounties and uh, cash money for the Sandcastle teams. And so that's that's kind of what's up and coming and, and kind of on the radar for September. Um, so those are those are good places to kind of follow. Awesome. Well, again, Chris, really appreciate all your time and all your knowledge. And for everyone listening, stay Cryptocurrent. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of Cryptocurrent. 
For more information on this episode and all of our episodes, please visit us at www.crypto-current.co. Stay up to date with the latest news in cryptocurrency. You'll receive daily emails Monday through Friday that are personalized and curated content specific to you and your interest, powered by artificial intelligence. Are you an accredited investor looking to invest in cryptocurrency? Crescent City Capital can help. Go to crescentcitycapital.com for more information. If you're finding value in our content, please take five minutes to leave a five-star review and a great comment. Also, please make sure to share this podcast with others. Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the quality of this podcast. I can only thank my amazing producer, Andrew DeRitter, with DeRitter Productions, who has put this together. If you have any podcast, visual, or video needs, please go to DeRitterProductions.com. That's D-E-R-I-T-T-E-R Productions.com. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Cryptocurrent with Richard Carthon. We'll be back with more exciting developments from the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency next week. But until then, stay cryptocurrent.